Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on ultrasonic transducers, specifically their construction, damping, and bandwidth. We'll begin with the definition of a transducer. Whilst in general terms, a transducer is a device which converts energy from one form to another, in ultrasonics, we tend to reserve the transducer to mean a device that has some form of ultrasound generation capability. This could be a transmit-only device, such as we would find in therapeutic ultrasound, or is used in sonar chemistry or many other industrial processes. Or it could be a transmit-receive device, as we would expect to see in pulse echo imaging and in non-destructive testing. We tend to use the term hydrophone to mean a device that is receive-only, something that has no transmit capability at all. Let's look at the construction of a basic transducer. We start off with a piezoelectric element. In this case, I've shown a spherically focused one. There'll be some form of supporting structure and some form of backing to the transducer. This will all be within some form of transducer case and may well have a matching layer to help adjust the acoustic impedance on the front surface. There'll be a connection to the rest of the drive circuitry, and this may well travel via some form of impedance matching network. It's important to realize that many of the aspects of this transducer construction, but specifically the piezoelectric element, the backing, and to some extent impedance matching can introduce damping. Let's look at the different types of piezoelectric material. Initially, we have piezoceramic materials. There's a wide variety of properties of these materials, from some which are highly resonant, and therefore undamped, to those which have got reasonable levels of internal damping. We have 0-3, or as one shown here, 1-3 piezo composites. We could have piezo single crystal materials. And finally, we could have piezo polymers. Some piezo film is shown here. This is PVDF. And this has very high levels of internal damping. Before we carry on any further, I'm going to borrow a concept from amplifier design. That's the concept of gain bandwidth product. For a given amplifier, we could look at lots of different configurations. In the first configuration, we have relatively high gain, but that gain is distributed over quite a narrow bandwidth. If we wish to increase the bandwidth, we would have to accept that gain has to be a little lower. And finally, very wide bandwidth is only achievable with only moderate gain. Note in each case that the area of the configuration shown, one, two, and three, is the same. That's because gain times bandwidth is a constant for a given amplifier. That concept's very useful when we come to consider transducers. We'll start here by looking at a relatively narrowband transducer. Here we can see that the output amplitude, whilst centered at about 2.7 megahertz, falls off rapidly as we move to either side of that center frequency. Compared with this transducer, which has got a lower overall output, but is able to provide energy output at a wide range of frequencies. In fact, if we use bandwidth as a way of quantifying these different curves, we find that the first curve has a 6 dB bandwidth of about 11% of center frequency. The second curve has got a 6 dB bandwidth of about 94% of center frequency. And this is because the second curve is a highly damped curve, whereas there's very little damping to lead to a very resonant device for the blue curve. Let's have a look and see how that translates to the time signature output by the transducers in response to an electrical impulse. This is the narrow band low damping transducer. We can see that it's got quite high amplitude, but a very long burst with the ring down being some 12 to 15 cycles. In contrast, the highly damped transducer rings down very rapidly, 
It's a much shorter pulse, but has got much lower amplitude. Damping has been mentioned several times already, so it seems appropriate to now consider its causes and effect. Please note, this is not an exhaustive list of the causes of damping within a transducer, just a couple of examples to give you the general idea. We'll start by considering a random distribution of scatterers embedded within a polymer matrix and an ultrasonic wave which is propagating towards them. As the wave starts to interact with the scatterers, they will move relative to the surrounding polymer matrix. These vibrations cause friction and in turn, we get internal heating of the polymeric material. We may also see thermal effects if we have expansion and contraction of polymer chains as a result of interaction with an ultrasonic wave. All polymers are viscoelastic and therefore there will be some loss associated with this and that loss of energy is also as a form of heat. In either case we've seen that energy has been converted from acoustic energy to thermal energy and otherwise useful acoustic output has become heat. It's also useful to see how the choice of piezo material fits within this. We've already mentioned piezo polymers and piezo ceramics, but let's look at some of the other aspects. So clearly we've mentioned that piezo polymers are highly damped and piezo ceramics can be highly resonant. We've also seen that the bandwidth is narrow band for a resonant device and much broader band for a damp device. And because we've lost energy into heating, the coupling efficiency tends to be much higher for piezo ceramic device and much lower for a piezo polymer. And in this context, we're talking about the coupling from electrical energy to mechanical energy. Finally, the acoustic impedance is another important consideration for transducer design, and this tends to be quite high for piezo ceramics, but low for piezo polymer devices. You'll notice we've not yet mentioned composites or single crystals, and that's because they tend to sit somewhere in the middle of this. There's quite a range of options that we have with those. So, to summarise, we've seen that low damping transducers have a narrow bandwidth, but very high efficiency. This is typical of therapy and sonication applications. High damping transducers leads to very short broadband pulses but the efficiency has been reduced. And we typically find these in imaging and non-destructive testing applications. And damping always causes heating. We hope you found this interesting. If you did, come back and find some more of the Precision Acoustics tutorial videos.